Well, good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, during my time as president of the Royal College of Physicians, I had very good and very productive uh, relationship with the Royal College of Anaesthetists. So to celebrate your 25th year is wonderful. I'm going to talk to you about how we might try to enable people to be healthy enough to be in, in work and in sustainable work, what you do if people are on sick leave and how do you sensibly and carefully encourage them back to work and what can we do if people have taken that dreadful journey into our benefit system because we know if you live in our benefit system your mental and physical health is worse, you become deconditioned and getting back into work is really extremely difficult. I'm going to take you back 10 years. I became National Director in 2006, but it was in 2005, it was then a Labour government. Um, the position then was that sickness absence was a really persistent problem, and if anything, it was on the increase. And the problem was that too many people were leaving the labour market, <coughs> not temporarily, but often permanently. And even if they were at work, many people weren't giving of their best. They just were in a place where it was impossible to work to their very best ability. We had a rising bill for our welfare benefits, increasing healthcare costs, because if you are unemployed, you tend to use our health services more. And we still, and it, it's been persistent in, since 2005, if you look at the productivity in this country, it is much worse than we would wish it to be and much worse than many of our competitors. And if you add to that, that we are living longer, but are we able to work longer in good health? Not necessarily. I fear we have an epidemic of obesity with all its chronic conditions. Uh, we're now the fifth fattest nation in the world. That is nowhere where we ought to be or would want to be. And we do have um, this increase in chronic diseases, often multiple chronic diseases. And if you look at certain professions, there is a tendency to retire early, so take teaching where often teachers say they're retiring earlier because of the stress. So that was in 2005. 2005, the government uh, published this very uh, sensible strategy. And for once, it was a very small document, so you could easily uh, read it. But what they wanted to achieve, and I think it doesn't matter which government is in power, we all, I think, could agree with what, what this document said I thought was very sensible. It was about health and well-being of working age people. Could we give it the attention it deserved? We, the health professionals, the employers, uh, work recognised by all as important and beneficial and that we started breaking down some of the barriers that were really barriers to people returning or remaining in work and that the healthcare services met the needs of people who were in work. And at that time, they decided that they needed a national director for work and health. Of course, I'm not an occupational health physician. Um, and when I went to the interview and said this, they said, well, we actually would like somebody with no baggage and who comes at it completely. Um, we, yes, a good physician, but not necessarily an occupational health physician. So I became National Director for Health and Work, a five-year program, properly funded, so we could really do something which was really very um, refreshing. And after that, I've remained an advisor to government. What I hope we could all agree with is that if as a society we wish to be, um, as we are at the moment, a welfare state, then we have to have as many people as possible in work paying taxes so that those people who can't work whether it be the children whether it be the students whether it be people who are seriously ill and have no capacity to go to work the people who are unemployed pensioners do we are have we got enough of us in the workplace to ensure that those people are looked after and there are some very critical transition zones that transition zone from when you are 
in school, a young person, perhaps going into higher education. How do we ensure people become sustainable workers? And though there's no time to discuss it today, I would go right back into the schools for that. And then, when we all get to a certain age, many people would like to continue to work. They don't necessarily want to do the full job they've done before. But how do we enable people to feel well enough to still contribute um, to society? And of course, volunteering is a form of contribution, uh, which is equally important. So being sufficiently healthy, both mentally and physically, is necessary if we're going to be in the workplace and maximizing our health as, uh, for as long as possible, for a proportion of our total life, I think is a desirable goal, both for the individual and society. But as I mentioned earlier, if you look at populations at the moment, particularly in the developed world, we're often acquiring several conditions, whether it be hypertension, cardiac disease, a bit of diabetes, some osteoarthritis, etc. And all of that might combine um, to make it difficult to be in the workplace. But what I didn't realize as a rheumatologist, I don't know that they taught it me at medical school, I wish they had, I had a very poor understanding of the social determinants of health. But when you think about them, these are the real things that depend, that affect whether you will be well and whether you will be able to be a sustainable worker. And some of these children are born into these conditions. They have very little choice about what happens. So it was mentioned earlier, this very early life, what happens to us when we're very small, affects enormously uh, what we become. Stress, we feel it maybe when we're adults, but it could be stress in childhood too. Social exclusion, if you become unemployed and you're in the benefit system, your world does narrow. It narrows and narrows until what you often are doing is only really interacting with the immediate members of your family. Work and unemployment is one of the most powerful determinants of whether we are well. Addiction, of course, affects whether we can be in work and whether we're well, and indeed food, and whether you've got transport. If you think about the Welsh Valleys, it's quite difficult for people there to be in work, now there are no mines, and transport either north or south is difficult. So transport is equally important. And I hadn't really thought about these as factors which affected whether we were in work. It's easier to think about these things. So the reasons why we're not in work today, if you take it from rather more, if you like, medical point of view, uh, common mental health problems, musculoskeletal problems, they're the big bundle. But please note, I have not called them diseases. Back pain is not a disease. It is a symptom. Stress is not a disease. It is a symptom. These are common. And surely we ought to be able to deal with them such that they don't take people into our benefit system. 40% plus of the people who sit in our benefit system started with pretty mild mental health problems that have become chronic. They shouldn't be there. They ought to have been enabled to be back in work. And if you add to that the quality of the workplace, because I don't want people in bad work, I want people in good work, when I did my second report for government and we went out and talked to people who were collecting their medical certificates, I did this report with David Frost. Um, what they often said to us, well, I would go back to work, um, but I'm not going back to that manager. So people leave their managers. Often they don't leave the job. And you really have to add this in. Um, to thinking about whether people can be well and in work. And you might like to reflect on that in terms of our hospitals today. And so, do you have a good CEO? Does that CEO really care about the health and well-being um, of the organisation? Is there a non-executive member of the board that reports to the board on the health and well-being of the staff? 
the hospital in York do this extremely well. The NHS Trust there have really got this thing nailed. They do, they do board engagement extremely well. And have we trained all our managers um, in people management? And have we added a mental health component to that? Well, the answer to that on the whole is no. And then, of course, there are other important reasons. And of course, there are proper diseases. But they're not the big volume stuff, as, um, as I put on this slide here. So work its value. Um, I think it's interesting, we're none of us, I think, in our medical training, although I certainly tried to influence the curriculum um, in various colleges about how you introduce the concept of work being an important determinant of health. But if you go back to Galen, employment is nature's physician and is essential to human happiness. And William Osler obviously thought that health and, and work were pretty um, integrated. And to the young, it brings hope to the middle age confidence and to the aged repose. So there have been physicians who thought that work was important. And on this slide, I've just put some of the things that good work will bring. And it's this concept that you don't have to be 100% fit to be in work, otherwise most of us wouldn't be there, which is the truth, uh, when you get to a certain age. And remember the old medical certificate was a binary note. The GP had to put you 100% fit or you 100% unfit. Well, that was really quite ridiculous. The new note, which came in after my first review, the fit note um, is a good instrument, but sadly, less than 17% of general practitioners fill it in properly. Despite a lot of education, that is really a challenge and something that makes me personally very unhappy. Do we as a country get this right? I, I wish I didn't have to show you this slide. It gives me absolutely no pleasure. But this is us, top of a list that we really wouldn't wish to be at the top of. So this is uh, from an OECD report. The UK has the most new claimants per thousand of the working population. That's an inflow re rate for health benefits. Um, it, it, and, and I mean, it, it, it seems dreadful that we should be topping this list, which means we have more and more people going into our benefit system despite all that we have tried to do. So we obviously, as yet, have not got this right. And I apologise for this very complicated slide, but if you wonder what I've been doing for the last 10 years, this is it. I've really been trying to keep people here, um, but I need doctors to help to keep people there and other healthcare professionals. I've tried to reduce the amount of sickness absence and make sure that people don't languish there. The longer you're in sickness absence, the more likely you are um, to go into our benefit system. And if you take that journey into our benefit system, it is often long and unpleasant. And really, I'm not, it's obviously not time to go through all of the work capability assessment and the different types of benefits. But everything we have designed and it doesn't matter which sort of government's been in power. And it's all been for the good reasons that they've tried to um, design things. But they've all sent us in the wrong direction. And all the work I've been trying to do is to bring this arrow back this way. And really, what I would say is there's too little done early enough to prevent sickness absence. And really, early intervention has not been sufficiently well designed. Now all of us, and I'm going to include anaesthetists here, can do something about this because so many of you know so much about pain. And pain is one of the top reasons why people take sickness absence and um, are not in work. Now what would we want um, if we're going to reverse that dreadful journey? Uh, well, we want people to be identified as quickly as possible and to understand their problems. We want to ensure um, that we get early, quick intervention. We do want our GPs to write those sick notes or fit notes as well as possible. 
We do now have an in, a, a national fit for work service. It doesn't run as well as we would like it to run yet. And employers refer more often than GPs. That seems to me to be perhaps the wrong way around. Um, and for those who've got conditions compatible with the work they have, so musculoskeletal or maybe anxiety or stress, then to support them to return to work. And if they can't go back to that job, I think we need to be much more innovative about thinking about a job change. If people are capable of being in the labour market, what do we have to do to enable them to be there? So the essential ingredients are work knowledgeable health professionals who understand what good work is and why it's important to be in work. Employers who create good work and good workplaces, which is crucially important. And then employees, or as they may become patients, who are indeed health seeking and who do have a sense of well-being. You really need all of those three. And creating good work and good workplaces, I've talked about what we need from management. Um, I've been trying since 2008 in my first review. I suppose, I hope I was constructively critical about occupational health. I would like occupational health, both its doctors and its nurses, to take a much broader view, to be interested in mental health in the workplace, to really be upstream and think about prevention and promotion of health. And that we really think about promoting health and well-being um, in the workplace to keep us fit. So I think I'm talking about public health in the workplace because actually it doesn't really happen in primary care. I don't think any of us here go to our GP to waste their time to say, you know, am I fit? We just don't do that. Um, I don't think many of us probably go to say, how do I lose weight? Um, or how do I become more active? We wait and go when we're sick. I think this is absolutely crucially important. And there is a whole lot of work that needs to be done within any organization, which is strategic and operational, integrating what you would understand as conventional health and safety the sort of stuff that the HSC is interested in, and then promotion and prevention. So what do I want of all of us? Um, and that's any doctor and any healthcare professional to really understand that returning someone to their functional capacity is a health issue. I would say for any clinical doctor sitting in clinic, talking to a patient who comes in they ought to really say, are you in work? If you're not in work, why? And what can I do to help? And we absolutely do not have that culture. But, you know, if you're an operating, putting in a new knee, and you've got a good uh, sort of technical result, well, if the person isn't back to their functional capacity and their normal life, have you done a really good job? Have you done a complete job? We tend to think we have but actually we've thought about only half of the person. So return to proper functional capacity. I think we do have to think about the psychosocial aspects as well. And it seems ridiculous that I was a rheumatologist. I knew about physical rehabilitation, but until I did this job, I never knew about vocational. I'm almost ashamed to say that to you. But for me, vocational rehabilitation is anything that enables someone to return to work and to their previous functional capacity. And I have briefly mentioned that I think we have to think very carefully about medical training. I know the curricula are full. I know it's not easy. But this is about keeping people whole as human beings. Um, in 2008, when I uh, was writing my first review, I got all the medical royal colleges to sign this consensus statement, and I know you're there as well. Um, and it was signed in 2008, encouraging uh, the colleges to really uh, buy into this agenda. What about the role of anaesthetists? Well, you talk to patients. You 
see quite a lot of patients. And therefore, could you make every contact count? I know it's perhaps outside of what you would normally do, but I think it would add to people's lives. This is where you really come into your own because pain is such a common reason why people will not be in the workplace. And I had the privilege uh, of contributing to Age and the, the Anaesthetist, uh, published by the association, but I know endorsed by this college. So I think anaesthetists have a role to play um, as well. So that's a quick run through some of the things I've been doing in the last uh, 10 years. But I firmly believe this to be true. And if you talk to people who are out of work for a long time, many of you will say they don't have any sense of self-worth and they don't feel they are making any contribution. And I've just finished a report for the government on those people who are in our benefit system who are either addicted to drugs and alcohol and never more than then has this been absolutely true. These people have no sense of worth and no sense of contribution and getting them back is a huge journey, a great long journey um, that is difficult to do. So thank you very much indeed.